I know you're a mom, above all else. You're a mom that found yourself caught up in this whirlwind that no one would have ever expected. And here we are, you know, you said in your victim impact statement that you feel a grief that lives deep inside of your soul and extends there. And then I saw you today in front of the courtroom, and I gotta be honest, I don't know what a person looks like who has just had the weight of the world lifted off of their chest, but as close as that can be is sort of what you represented today. After having waited so long for answers, how would you characterize the emotions you experienced? Oh, I, I, I don't know if you can really take your emotion and, and put it into words. It, it's just, it's, it's a lot of, so many different feelings that are going on and, and your mind is racing and you think about, you, you begin to go back to the beginning. I, I think that was the first thing I had was I went back to day one. I went back to May 31st, 2005 at 4 a.m. I was face to face with my daughter's killer that night at the Holiday Inn, but I didn't know it. I didn't know that I was face to face with her killer. I thought I was face to face with a suspect that was involved in her disappearance. So for the first thing that happens is I think everything just shifts back. It just throws you, kind of slams you back in time. And that was kind of like, those are the first steps that start unfolding in your mind. And to think about then you fast forward it back. So it's this, you know, flipping back and forth in time of 18 years, of what you thought then, what you know now, and you apply it back then. It's just shocking. It's shocking that we had it then, you know, but we just couldn't get him to say it. I admit it. Why do you think now? Why did he acknowledge this after 18 years? Well, he'd never been in federal custody. He'd never been picked up by the U.S. Marshals and team of FBI from Miami and Birmingham. He'd never been arraigned in a Birmingham court at Hugo Federal Black Courthouse. So, you know, if there were an incentive, I mean, this was every incentive for him to finally tell the truth because, look, I mean, it was real. For the first time we had him, for the first time he was in our custody, he was the first time he was under our federal agents. And we had been begging for that since 05. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had all the federal agents there in 05, but Aruba wouldn't have it. Mm -hmm. They would not have the FBI agent that was standing there ready, willing to do anything and everything. They would not allow them. And then you personally had to implore through George, the government of Peru, to have yes. him extradited yes. here. Yes, yes. So George Seymour with Patriot Strategies and his, his business associate, Mark, they, they were able to, you know, we felt like Greta and I were carrying this ball and we could push it down the field and push it down the field, but dang, we just couldn't get it over, just couldn't get it at the end zone or over the line. And then, you know, when George and Mark stepped in, it was like, like April, <laughs> April of 2023. And then it was just like, I was like, where did these guys come from? I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, so we, we just, we just had to have George and Mark to, they are the ones who made it happen to get it over the finish line. We couldn't do it. We were almost getting shut down because there was, you know, there was a lot of, unfortunately, there was a lot of civil unrest going on in Libya. There was, mm -hmm. there was a very tumultuous time with their government and things like that. So I really felt like it's not going to happen. You said something to me, or you said something earlier today that really struck me. You said that this is better than closure. It is. Why is this better than closure? Well, for me, the never ending nightmare is over. And I, I don't, the word closure, I think it's different to, uh, to all victims. I think they interpret it as different. But, you know, for me, closure is not what I got. I got, it's over. It's solved. Now these cases solved. You're on Vandersloot. It's not her. It's not the suspect in Natalie's disappearance. You're on Vandersloot. It's the murderer. So, of Natalie. And that meant that my nightmare is over. And all I've done for 18 years is going down millions and millions of rabbit holes. There were so many swirling theories, and I think in hindsight, maybe there were so many swirling theories. It's because we did we couldn't get the answer. We couldn't we couldn't get anything. We couldn't get your on. You've been living with the unknown for 18 years. Yeah. Every night that you go to sleep, every day that you wake up, you still did not have finality in knowing what happened no. to your daughter. Every day or every morning when I kiss her senior portrait goodbye in my bedroom and tap her on the cheek, you know, we've never been able to put it to rest and, and, and put all the swirling theories and crazy things to rest. But, but I, I was to no fault of anyone. I mean, I was in it too, because we, 
we couldn't get the answer. When you and Dave and Matt were in that room and he was offering his proffer, and we didn't know, I mean, the general public didn't know, was he going to plead guilty to extortion, to wire fraud charges? Oh. What were we going to learn? And then all of a sudden, a confession comes out. What went through your mind in that moment? Well, I was fortunate that I was able to be a part of this process. And, I mean, the team here, the team in F the FBI in Miami, the FBI in Birmingham, the U.S. Attorney's Office really did an amazing job of letting me understand what was happening real time versus relaying it secondhand. So, you know, it is shocking to hear, of course, but I had to do it. I, I felt like it was better for me to hear it real time and just brace myself and take the hit because I had to know. Were you stunned by the depravity, both of what he did to your daughter, but also the behavior that you mentioned after the fact, right after he'd committed murder. Exactly. And, and it was funny because that was what threw me off, and I think it threw a lot of us off in 05, because I'm like, well, okay, how could he have murdered her? And then he goes home and checks the soccer scores, gets on a porn site, and gets up, takes a shower, and goes to school. Well, oh, hey, there you go. There's that other 18 years fast-forwarded. Now I know why. Because he's pathologically... Well, he's, he's just... You know, all he really has is those functions of existence of anger, killer, sex, and food. I mean, look, he ate, he ate his breakfast over Stephanie Flores' bludgeon body. And then with Natalie, of course, when he was denied sexual gratification with her, what does he do? I had to tell him. He goes home, gets on porn to get off. I mean, who, I mean, that's a killer. That is a person with no conscience, no remorse, no guilt. So that there were those little things, those elements. When I go back to '05 and think of '18, what he said now, yeah, that's him, and that's that's just his mode of existence. This is a reflection of, of who he is as an individual, which is to say, something that none of us could comprehend in terms of that behavior. And you know, I'm wondering. As you're, as you're learning all of this, you then know, I'm going to be confronting this person. And you, you offered this incredibly brave victim impact statement today. Yeah. One of the things that you said to him was, what if your daughter were Natalie? What if you were me? Did you plan that or was it organic? It was just organic. And I started, I, I would kind of, since I was able to hear a lot of things real time, I kind of was beginning to understand what maybe some of his pressure points and his daughter seemed to be one, which I know a killer typically doesn't have any emotional attachment or anything, mm -hmm. but for some reason, even wild animals protect their young. And so, or, you know, sometimes, but he, I felt like if, if he only heard this much of what I said, just a scintilla, that it would have been something when I mentioned the name that now I'm going to say we have something in common, a daughter, because that, He's very, uh, you start talking about his daughter, that really uh, affects him. You knew that was a pressure point. I knew it was a pressure point, but I didn't know how I was going to say it, but I felt like I wanted to leave her name out, and I understand that because she doesn't deserve mm -hmm. to have the father that she does. I watched you walk up to the stand, and the first thing that you did as you got up was you looked at him. Whatever sort of fears or demons or just the reality of knowing what he had done and said, you still looked at him, went to the stand, started your statement, and then looked at him again and said, you look like hell and I'm not sure you're going to make it. Did that just all materialize in the yeah. moment also? Yeah, it did. I felt like, I, I guess I thought, I, you, know, don't, you know, victims in Paxing, I thought I was going to be just addressing him personally, like standing like this face to face with him. So that's why... I had, you know, referenced his name more. I didn't realize, and it was fine. I just didn't realize the, that my back was going to be to him. But I felt like since my impact statement was for and to him, I felt like I had to turn around because that's who the statement was for. And maybe he didn't deserve to see, you know, I think he deserved to see the parts where I felt like were a pressure point for him, mm -hmm. his daughter and... Uh, and his looks. When he apologized to you, 
Did you take that as sincere? No, because I know his levels of existence, and that is not it. He doesn't have that in his existence. And I think, but it, just to say the words, it's fine. It didn't mean anything. They don't mean anything. Were you or were Dave or Matt in their impact statements giving, I'm guessing, many, many hours to what you included in there? How, how difficult was it to form the words to actually say to him in person, once you'd known he'd confessed to killing your daughter? Oh, it wasn't as hard as what you think. And the reason why is because the not knowing is more torturous than the knowing. Mm -hmm. And I know parents or families who are victims of, you know, their loved ones are victims in crimes like this. I think that is probably somewhat, I don't know, there's not a normal, but I feel like that is probably could be more common than not. And I think the not knowing is worse you know, the, the knowing is shocking. You brace yourself. You take the hit. But the not knowing is the never-ending nightmare, and that's worse. And that's the boat that you were in. Yeah. For almost 20 years of your life. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. But now you do know. And the yeah. knowing is horrific in terms of the details of what he did. It is. It is. It is. And it's shocking to us to think that somebody is capable of doing that so nonchalantly. It's almost as if he brushed his teeth and got dressed and drove his car. And, but remember, I was also able to hear him, uh, you know, say these things. And there's, there, it, it's, it's if it's normal to him. It's if it's routine to him. It felt perfunctory, you think, yeah, as he, he described it. Yeah, it's just, it's just, that's what happened. You know, there was nothing, there's no, there's no difference in the tone or it's just, it's just who he is. And I think that is probably typical of a lot of killers. I don't think they have. Or obviously, they wouldn't be killers if they had any type of real sorrow or suffering. I want to ask you about Natalie in a second and just the freedom you have now to, to remember her in a way where at least you don't have questions still hanging yeah. over your head. Because you smile and just the idea yeah. of that. Yeah. But also, just the judge's comments in court struck me too. I mean, I was thinking about what were the things that really stood out. And when she described his behavior as, as heinous, mm -hmm. in her words, for exploiting and choosing someone yeah. who was just trying to find information about her daughter who had disappeared, that he yeah. had chosen you, but then heinous to the extreme to then knowingly provide that person with false information. What was your reaction to the judge's words and characterization? It, it, I knew it was horrific and shocking, but it was nice for the judge to say it because... Just think, I paid my daughter's killer. So I paid killer fees to the person that bludgeoned my daughter to death. I mean, who who does that? And, I, uh, and who, it's, it's shocking. But it was, but it really made me feel stronger with her saying mm. that because I'm thinking, you know, I, I get caught up in the two, the, he's a double murderer, but I was glad that she brought it out that, you know, not only, I was glad she recognized it as, as a heinous, horrific act. I was really grateful. Recognition and empathy, understanding. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she was very strong about it. And I was shocked. I didn't know that was coming. But I was glad to hear it. Yeah, I'm sure everyone else was too. Do you think 20 years is enough time? The judge mentioned she didn't want to jeopardize the murder confession by rejecting this deal. I don't think any victim's family is going to think ever an amount of time is enough, whether it's the death penalty. I think there's never, there's never enough. So here's what I have to take comfort in is what I needed. And I needed the answers as to what happened to Natalie. And I also remind myself that I'm not the one in 2005 that let him go murder, that let him get, you know, off scot-free of murdering Natalie. They could have found, they could have found this out in 2010. I mean, I worked, I worked like hell in 2005 trying to keep him in prison or jail. Ariba wouldn't do it. They let him go. I worked equally as hard in 2010 trying to do it because I knew. I knew he I knew he was bad. And so I'm not, I can't take that burden on. That, that's Aruba's problem. Aruba's the one that has the double murder, not me. Your mom instinct told you he was definitely involved. Involved. I, I couldn't hear or see why or how. But now I do hear and see why and how.
How does this allow you to just love and appreciate your daughter and who she was and her dreams even more? Well, I think now it becomes easier for me to appreciate her life through my son's life and through his children's lives. And I hadn't really been as, you know, I've been a little distracted. So I feel like now I can kind of like, oh, <laughs> oh, now I can focus on that. Invest yeah. as, as a grandparent and a yeah. parent in the way that you want. It's kind of a, you know, I'm not illegal. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be investigating something for the rest of my life. That's the way for you good. felt for basically a decade and a half. Um, yeah. How did you do this? How did you go and talk to people and, and warn parents and try to create awareness while dealing with the pain and the anguish that you know that we're experiencing um, every day? Well, I'm an educator. So I've been an, an educator for over 30 years. And I think for me, it's about you know, sharing life lessons and the hard lessons that we learned because I was really in the tragedy. I was really fortunate to be able to uh, have those opportunities to go and to speak to other young adults, you know? So anyway, that was, that was kind of one of the silver linings in it. It was. And I want to say too, I spoke with John Q earlier this week and he yeah. said this traumatized a generation of families and kids yeah. worried about sending their daughters yeah. to vacations with their high school classmates because of what happened. Yeah. Does any of what happened in the last 24 hours for you embolden this as a deterrent and for people to know there will be justice at the end of the day? I hope it will give families that are searching for either their, you know, either their loved one's perpetrator Maybe they're just searching for the remains of their loved one or what happened to them. But I hope that in some way it will give them hope and encouragement to persevere and to just never give up and to just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Because, look, I didn't know where I was going. 18 years, I, I never had a destination. You know, you just keep going and you hope you'll get there, but you don't really get caught up in that. You just keep, you just keep going on the destination to see where you're finally going to arrive. It does strike me as a parent. I think about if anything ever happened to me, what my mom would do or say. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in the world. No one will love you like your mom loves you. Yeah. And so I feel like you've sort of taken that and, and made that your mission, not just for you, but for yeah. other families as well. Yeah. And is that I, how it feels? I, yes, it does. And I have spoken to tens and tens and tens of thousands of these young adults and all over the United States and, in, and even other areas. So, and it, it just feels good to... You know, all, I think all, we, all of us just need kind of a heads up or personal safety reminder or just something to get, out, get us out of our sense of complacency. So I feel like that was good work, and I'd pledge that in Aruba in 05 that I was going to pound those podiums and tell these young adults a personal safety, travel safety lesson. So I'm fortunate that I was able to do that, and in some way that was also helping me heal as well. And now that you're at least in the process of healing with this information, how yeah. are you going to remember... Natalie, just the fact that you said she had aspirations to be a mom, but also a doctor. You could see the path, right? Yeah. And you've been so obsessed, singularly, rightfully so, for trying to figure out what happened to your daughter all of these years. Yeah. How do you remember her now in light of this? Mm. As I said, I think I remember her now. I, I know. I, it's, it's like through my son. I see her life living through him. And he's become so accomplished. He's a airline pilot. And two beautiful children and a family and, you know, and that's what, you know, I know Natalie would have been equally as accomplished as her brother, Matt. So that is what, you know, I want to focus on now. And I don't know, wake up tomorrow, tomorrow's a new day, but today was, um, today was a, a victory. And um, that's when you transition truly from victim to victor. So today was it. An undoubted victory. Last two questions, just logistical. One, the corroboration. I was kind of confused. Yes. When, like, are yeah. they going to corroborate? How are they going to corroborate this? So well, we took polygraph tests. How confident are you right now that this is the real truth? It wasn't just a polygraph test. I mean, we have to think about this was a whole series of different things that were going on events. The proffer. Then I was able to, remember, I was able to see everything real time, which was another very fortunate um, aspect. And also was able to meet I was able to meet the team, to meet the polygrapher, and they're coming in. This team, the teams came, came in from Miami, and we have the Birmingham FBI, we have the Miami FBI, we have the polygrapher. Then it was a whole process mm -hmm. that went, um, that was transpiring in order to get to the truth and have the U.S. District Attorney and everyone and all of us confident. 
you feel confident they've yes. arrived at the truth. Yes, yes. And then lastly, how did you know his activity, all the things that he did after the fact? You know, I know you cited it in court today, the, the perverse behavior following. But how did, how did, you know, did investigators tell you that? I was able to sit and listen to him real time. He actually acknowledged this himself, that yes. he did those things. Yes. Yes. And you have to face this human being again. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that must have been the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, but I was so grateful to have the answer because, as I said, the not knowing is more torturous than the knowing. It had to be done. Thank you so much for okay. doing this, Beth. I, I'm sorry that you've had to do another interview, and it's like right now, probably just trying to get to the finish line. But yeah. thank you for allowing people who have followed your yes. life story so closely to know yes. what you're going through right now. Very grateful for everyone's support. It's been just so heart heartwarming, so just incredible. Thank Blessings you. Blessings to you and your family. And hopefully tonight will be a lot easier than previous nights. Yeah, it will be. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.